Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Sam Adams to the show. Sam is the CEO and co-founder of Vert Asset Management. He also chairs the Investment Research Group. Sam leads the development of new products to help make sustainable investing easier for investors. He has been a featured speaker on sustainable investing at financial advisor conferences in the US, UK, Europe, and Australia. Sam, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Raj. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How's the weather where you're at? Uh, nice today. Um, I'm in San Francisco, or just north in Sausalito, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's uh, sunny. Cool for California, 55, but nice. It's a beautiful day. So I, so I asked intentionally because as of last night, we have 35 or 38 degrees in rain, so I figured where you were was going to be really nice. <laughs> Well, it feels positively uh, um, uh, balmy here. I was in Canada last week, and it was uh, minus 26. So oh, was, my word. Where in Canada? It was in Canmore, uh, which is near Calgary. It's the, the kind of the climbing center of uh, Alberta, the province. And so I was there to do some ice climbing, and it was cold. <laughs> which is, minus 20. Uh, yeah, Minus little, 26 is quite cold, yes. It's a little too cold even for ice climbing, so, <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of ice climbing, you know, I like to start the show off with something interesting about my guests that people might not be aware of. So, take it away, Sam. <laughs> well, it's like we, can, we can stay with the climbing thing. I like to say that I'm a climber and a capitalist, uh, and you don't... Uh, um, uh, there's a couple of things behind that. Um Uh, As a climber, uh, ice climber, rock climber, you know, alpinist, um, uh, you're naturally become an environmentalist, right? You're just always seeing the changes that happen to the snowpack or to the mountains, to the ice. And um, and so you you become passionate about environmentalism. Um, But I'm also a capitalist. I spent 20 years working in, in finance and in the capital markets, and I... I've witnessed, uh, as I think most of us have, the you know the growth and the success in 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 the world uh, that's been brought to us by capitalism. And so I'm a fan of capitalism, um, and usually environmentalism and capitalism are at odds with each other. That's kind of the normal way people think, or the traditional way people have thought about those things. And I'm uh, I'm a uh, a testament to the fact that it doesn't have to be that way. So the climbing piece, have you seen the Alex Honnold movie? Of course. I've seen it uh, several times. <laughs> um, um, actually, I went to UC Davis for my uh, graduate, my MBA, and uh, Alex went to UC Davis as well. We didn't overlap, but uh, it's, uh, um, it's kind of funny that he, he came out of a place so flat like uh, UC Davis that uh, – He's such a good climber. You know, you watch that work and you just think to yourself, um, the faith you need to have, the, the trust, the confidence, you know, all these different um, skills and emotions you need to put together to, to accomplish something like that is quite fascinating. Yeah, he's a, he's a different, different person, really. Uh, uh, I hesitate to say superhuman um, because that – suggests that he's just better at a lot of things than the rest of us are. And while that's absolutely the case, it's also important to recognize that he's playing a different game than most 99.9% of the climbing community, right? We're not, most of us aren't interested in putting our lives on the line like that. So we use ropes and things to to make sure that there's a margin of safety. Really, like you said, I'm superhuman. I'm a believer that, you know, there are mutants walking amongst us, so... Not a far-fetched thought. <laughs> yes. Newton did a good way, I think. Um, so switching gears a little bit, can you share a little bit about your current organization? So um, we started Vert Asset Management about four years ago, and we're a dedicated sustainable investment management firm. And what we're specifically trying to help on is – getting financial advisors, high net worth individuals, the, 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 
the main street, if you will, uh, community of investors to start investing on a sustainable basis. The big institutional players, you know, the big pension funds, they invest on a sustainable basis, environmental, social governance um, criteria is what they use usually. Uh, they've been doing that for a while. Um, but there's been a lack of movement in the space for the families, the individual investors, and, and their financial advisors. And so we built the company to help that community start moving their money to be invested on a sustainable basis. So what did you see four years ago that made you move in this direction? Well, I was working for a, a very large mutual fund company called Dimensional Fund Advisors. I was heading up their European uh, financial advisor business uh, for about 10 years. And I was launching a sustainable investing strategy uh, there to financial advisors in the UK and Germany and Switzerland, et cetera. And um, all the advisors there were happy with the strategy. They said, this is great. This is a, you know, a global equity strategy that's invested sustainably. Fantastic. But their question was, what do I do with the rest of the portfolio, the other asset classes in the portfolio? Uh, what, what am I supposed to use for that? And how do I talk to my clients about this? And so I approached my wife who had an impact investing consulting business uh, that she had started. She was helping financial advisors do exactly this, impact investing and sustainable investing. And I said, what, uh, what are the funds that advisors are using for the other parts of the portfolio and what are the conversations that they're having with clients? And she said, well, there's not a lot in the funds in the other asset classes. There's, there's a lot of holes in that. Uh, there's not a lot of offerings um, that financial advisors can use. Um, and they're really struggling to have conversations with clients about what it means to invest sustainability, sustainably and, and what it does and what it accomplishes and, and what do you get as a result of it. So we saw this hole that there were not a lot of uh, tools in terms of investment products and not a lot of education uh, for financial advisors around uh, investing sustainably, how to actually implement the portfolios and then how to talk to about it with clients. Uh, and so we wanted to uh, provide uh, that the resources to, for, to enable investors and financial advisors to do that. Because we think this is, this is the critical thing. Um, capitalism is this very powerful force uh, it can be used for good, it can be used for evil, it can be used for all kinds of things. Um, but if we get money invested on a sustainable basis, right, billions and hundreds of billions of dollars, it will encourage and in fact force companies, public companies, to behave on a sustainable basis. They will have to integrate environmental, social and governance uh, criteria into the way they operate their businesses. Um, because it will be in their best interest and because it's, their investors are demanding it. Um, and the world will start operating on a more sustainable basis. So uh, we think that the, that all the, all the, all the reasons are normal around capitalism to do things like profitability, efficiency, best use of capital, those types of things are there for sustainability. Now we just need the money to move uh, so that the companies can operate in that fashion. So it sounds like a lot of what you do is education. Right. How, exactly. do you provide, how do you provide that education? What form? Do you have classes or do you do seminars? How does that work? Well, uh, we do most of it face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, either through individual meetings with uh, financial advisors or through events that we either host or, or co-host or join. Uh, I'll give you an example. Next month, we're having a Build It Boot Camp uh, here in our offices, and we'll have um, a group of financial advisors come in who uh, are in the process of launching a sustainable investing so investment solution for their clients. And so in the morning, we'll sit down and help them build their investment portfolios. We'll, help, we'll teach them the research tools and the selection criteria and how to actually build out the types of portfolios they'd want to recommend to their clients. 
And then in the afternoon, we'll build, uh, help them build a suite of communication tools around that. You know, why are we doing this? What does it mean to do this? Uh, what can we expect from this? All those things. So that literally the next day, um, they could go to their clients uh, and offer them uh, a, a sustainable alternative to the conventional portfolios they're probably in. Now, are their clients retail investors, family offices, or other? Yeah, the, the typical um, uh, client of a financial advisor is a family or a high net worth individual, um, somewhere between you know, 100000 to $10 million in assets is typically where they uh, work, but they, you know, some of them have models where they go below that or above uh, that. So this isn't necessarily in the family office space uh, or the institutional or the endowment space. It's more working with individuals and families. And how have you seen the interest for your service change over the last four years? Well, it's really, really uh, taken off in the last year. There's been a steady climb in interest from uh, sustain, from financial advisors in sustainable investing, but it hasn't matched the interest in the underlying individual investors. And so when, you, when they do surveys of individual investors and say, hey, do you want to invest sustainably or do you want to invest with impact? The numbers are in the high majority. So overall, it's about 75% of investors surveyed say yes. The millennials are higher than that in the high 90s, uh, 95%. Um, the women are higher, they're 85%. And on average, it's about three quarters. So the, they've wanted to invest sustainably for a while. The financial advisors have been more reticent. They've been more reluctant. They've been waiting for the, the products to come online. They've been waiting for the products to have longer track records. Uh, they've been waiting to learn how to do this, right? How to talk about it. Um, and so, uh, it, but we're just starting to see in the last year, for example, the flows, the, the amount of money that goes into ESG mutual funds and ETFs quadrupled from the year before. So it's really starting to, to take off now. So, you know, last year we had that um, Jamie Dimon CEO roundtable announcement and we're recording today, January 22nd, 2020. Last week, uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock came out and made an announcement regarding investment strategies. Do you think we've reached that proverbial tipping point or hockey stick moment in ESP <laughs> investing? Yeah, I certainly hope so. Um, yeah, we won't know, right, for uh, maybe a decade or so, what was the tipping point or you know what it was. But there, these are all things that are adding uh, a large amount of fuel to this growing fire uh, of people's passion for investing for good, uh, people realizing that uh, they might need to invest this way just for good performance, right? Um, there's, a, there's a whole host of, of driving factors. I think Larry uh, Fink's letter uh, is going to uh, encourage a lot of people uh, to do this because it's very high profile. Well, you know, it's, it's not as well known that the 10 of the 10 largest pension funds in the world, right, from the Japanese one to the California Public Employer Retirement System to the, a couple of the Dutch ones and the Norwegian one, um, in that top 10, seven of those largest pension funds in the world invest on an ESG basis. So this has already been embraced by the biggest investors in the world, right? But those uh, entities aren't, you know, hitting the papers every day. When 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 BlackRock, the largest asset manager, uh, says it, and they have a lot of retail funds, it certainly causes a wave, or we hope so. I I, I agree. I I hope so too. So, Sam, one of the things I like to explore in this podcast is the why behind, you know what you're doing. And so the way I like to put it is that, look, there's an obvious opportunity cost. Four years ago, you could have decided to perhaps invest your time and energy somewhere else. What made you move in this direction? <laughs> well, I, um, I have a whole host of, of, of uh, personal reasons, um, but I will quote uh, Tom Steyer, who um, was presenting at a, a SRI conference uh, back in 2013 
Um, and he answered this question and he said, um, uh, I, uh, I am passionate about the environment because I have kids and I can read. Um, and <laughs> that was a pretty, uh, funny response, but, um, part of that is, is it resonates, uh, with me as well, but as a, as a climber, as a lifelong environmentalist and as a lifelong capitalist, um, I was always looking for a way to um, combine those two passions. And uh, like I said at the beginning, that, that there was, there's been this narrative that those are at odds with each other. Uh, and it really comes down from um, uh, what's perceived as a coupled relationship between economic progress and uh, pollution or greenhouse gas emissions, right? And if you actually, if you graph since the Industrial Revolution, the, uh, say, GDP or human progress and, and any other uh, measure you'd like, uh, it's been, you know, almost stratospheric rising upwards over the last hundred years. Tied to that very closely uh, is the rise in emissions. So we've basically burned our way uh, to success, Right. Uh, and um, if you're an environmentalist and you read, <laughs> you realize that we can't continue to do that. We're filling up the atmosphere and our oceans with that, those greenhouse gas emissions. And we just don't have room anymore for those without dire consequences. And so um, we need to decouple that relationship. We need to have human progress and GDP and economic growth continue, but we need to have the those negative things like pollution and CO2 emissions drop off. And that's actually, if you look at our logo, that's what our logo represents is a decoupling graph there. And I read a couple of books uh, by Paul Hawken, uh, Ecology of Commerce, Natural Capitalism, and more recently, Drawdown. And when you read his work and other people like, uh, Peter Diamandis, who wrote Abundance, and Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute, you realize that capitalism is the solution to climate change, to our uh, current situation. It's the only thing powerful enough to change the direction we're headed. Uh, and when I realized that, I got really excited about what we can do uh, by helping uh, shift capital from conventional investing to sustainable investing, it will actually shift capitalism to becoming a force for solving this uh, issue uh, rather than, you know, exacerbating it. You know, you mentioned Paul Hawkins book. I have a copy here on my desk. And if you ask me, it's exactly what you said. It's 100, or actually 99 opportunities of how to essentially mitigate some of these risks that we're facing and make money while doing so. Yeah. It's the, it's the, um, it's the, it's the exact opposite of what people think now that, you know, traditionally the, 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 the things we've heard from the environmentalist movement have been, you know, fly less, drive less, spend less, eat less red meat, you know, do, do a lot, less, 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 right. Which sounds like, less activity, less economic, uh, less profits, uh, more sacrifice. Um, and um, that's not what we need. What we need is less pollution, less negative externalities, right? So um, I, uh, for, uh, uh, just a personal example, um, I was, you know, I was really trying to stop driving because I had a gas car. And so I was trying to drive as, as little as possible. Um, but I have an uh, electric car now, and I get pure, clean energy at my house through a community green energy thing. So 100% renewable energy into my house, which charges my electric car. I can drive as much as I want now, uh, and I'm not causing any greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm contributing to traffic, right? But at least I'm not contributing to the climate uh, problem anymore. So the, we don't need to do less and less and less, we can do more as long as what we're doing is either circular in nature and not creating uh, any waste or any uh, 
uh, pollution uh, or is not harmful in other ways. You know, earlier when I asked the question about why, you mentioned uh, Tom Steyer and what he said about reading, but you said you had a host of other personal reasons. And I'd, if you're open to it, I'd love to explore some of those other reasons. And you mentioned envir- environmentalism too. Well, I don't, I, I, I don't know where I got this, uh, Raj, but I've, I think it was from my father, but I've always been a freak for efficiency. Like, I, like I'm the type of person who... Before I run some errands, I will, you know, make sure that I'm taking the most direct route with the fewest number of stops. And I've just spent a lot of time thinking about the most efficient way of doing things. And it really uh, bugs me when there's a better way of doing things that people aren't doing, right, Um, or that they aren't aware of. And I just, I've always wanted to say, hey, there's a better way. There's a better mousetrap. There's a more efficient, uh, cleaner way of doing that. Um, and when I realized that we have these solutions that we need, uh, that they're out there, um, and we just need to implement them, that really, t- that this really ties into that feeling of mine. Like, why, why would you continue to drive a gas car when there's these great, uh, alternatives in electric cars now, or at least hybrid cars now, you know, why would you, uh, uh, continue to build coal power plants when there's cheaper, cleaner, better <laughs> alternatives, right? And so it, when people continue to do the old, tired, inefficient, less uh, good ways of doing things because that's the way they've been done, uh, it's it really, really gets at me. And so working in this space, by helping people, you know, illuminating the better alternatives out there uh, is really rewarding for me. Well, like so that's one, one, one thing. Um, and um, the other one is that I think that um, uh, capitalism is, is environmentalism has got a bad name. Um, you know, that kind of less than do less story and capitalism has got a bad name. Um, but both of them uh, are really good uh, uh, systems that we need to get behind, and they are compatible. Um, my sister um, worked in Africa for 20 years in development. Um, she worked for an organization, a nonprofit organization, that uh, their mission was to stamp out poverty in Africa. Well, it's a big ask, right? <laughs> Especially for a nonprofit. Um, and she was an avowed socialist. And after doing this for 20 years, she came to me and said, hey, Sam, you got an MBA. Do you think I should get an MBA? And I said, an MBA? Why would you want an MBA? She's like, I've learned that giving money to these communities over and over again isn't working. Right? We need to build sustainable systems. We need to build profit-driven uh, solutions that continue that are sustainable, i.e. stay, like instead of feeding, giving the man a fish, teach him how to fish and, you know, he eats for a lifetime. Same thing with these communities. Instead of uh, sending in medicines or sending in food, we need to set up businesses there that can run on their own, okay, um, in perpetuity and provide those services. And that message that business and capitalism is going to be the solution to these, these, um, you know, um, problems that were really stuck in there uh, has resonated beyond her and me and, and my family, but also in the realm of impact investing uh, and sustainable investing. We know that uh, building sustainable uh, businesses is what's going to do the trick here. I agree. I think given the opportunity for people to have ownership and skin in the game goes a lot further than just giving. Absolutely. So Sam, switching gears a little bit, one of the questions I like to ask my guests is if you could share some advice with the audience, what would it be? Um, I would say um, money talks speak up. And that's our slogan uh, or our catchphrase. And what that means is that um, how you earn your money, how you save it, how you invest it, how you spend it uh, has impact in the world. 
And rather than um, be disconnected from that and kind of not know or not think about the downstream effects of how you will work with money, um, be intentional about it, right? Understand that what you know how your business is earning money or how you your salary is coming in, how that happens and, and what effect that has on the world. And when you uh, save at a bank, you know, what is that bank doing with uh, that money? You know, we moved up. Uh, I was a long-term client of uh, Wells Fargo after their scandals with what they were doing with people. We said, well, I don't need to fund that anymore. I'll move it to a, a local uh, uh, credit union. And now I know that my money's being used for good, right? Uh, invest your money in ESG or sustainability or SRI or something that you're passionate about or connected with. Because with the with the bank accounts and with the investment accounts, you don't have to sacrifice on performance. You get the same services, you get the same returns. So connect with that so that your impact is intentional. Um, and similarly, the way with you spend uh, the way you spend money, you know, choose uh, to buy things from companies that are doing things the way you like them, that are either giving back or taking care of the environment or working for a better world or, or however you like it. But um, I would I would say that's the, the the advice that I would give is get connected with how your money impacts the world and then um, do those things intentionally so that you are uh, you know doing all that that you can and you feel connected with yourself. I think it's kind of a funny thing um, that we spend all of our human capital, all of our, our work, our, our time and money turning ourselves into money, right? If you think about it, we work, we, we save, we create an investment portfolio. We've turned our, 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 our lifeblood into capital, into financial capital. We've turned our human capital into financial capital. And then we've kind of got divorced from it. And we say, oh, we'll give to philanthropy, you know, we'll give to charity. But we don't, you know, we don't really think of that money as, as ourselves. It's, it's something that we created, but it, it doesn't have any reflection on us, but it actually does. And so being intentional with it and then connecting to it, uh, I think is a very powerful thing for you, uh, for your family, and then broadly for the community and the planet. I love the idea of being intentional with money. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. Do you know if there are any, and I'm going to use the word easy, or any ways for, let's say, retail investors or individuals, is there a rating and ranking system for the banks? Um, there are a couple of, um, uh, I would say, I would, I don't know if there's one that ranks the banks uh, like that, uh, but I would say go with a, uh, a credit union. Um, and then if you want a bigger bank, um, then go with one of the banks that signed on to, uh, some of the, things, like the climate neutral pledges, uh, the SBGs. Whole bunch of banks have done that, um, and, and, and look for it that way. Any bank that's a certified B Corp, of course, uh, would be great as well. I appreciate that. One last question, since you brought it up regarding Paul Hawkins' book and Drawdown, are there any technologies that that are your favorite or that you're really interested in or any areas specifically that you just, you know, just like or are a fan of? Well, I like this fact that because it's, it's a bit unknown, um, real estate um, and buildings uh, generate 40% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. That's shocking to people. Um, and that's also scary to people because, wow, that sounds like a big problem. But it's actually one of the uh, easiest or, or most straightforward ones to tackle. We have smarter sensors, smarter thermostats, better heating and cooling systems, better windows, better air conditioners. Um uh, we have all the solutions we need to turn these buildings into non-consumers and non-producers, non-consumers of, of uh, net energy and non-producers of greenhouse gas emissions. And so all of that group of technology in the, in the smart buildings and smart city sector is uh, very, very exciting to me. It's a coincidence perhaps, but last week I was invited to take a tour of the old Sinclair building in Fort Worth, which is apparently the leading LEED certified building in the nation. They've gone to all low voltage 
and high efficiency. I think Marriott is now managing it. It's become a Marriott hotel. But if you're ever in town, I'm happy to arrange a tour for you. That would be great. Well, Sam, thank you so much for your time today. Are there any last words you'd like to share with the audience? Just uh, thank you for listening and uh, um, uh, do be intentional with your money. Thank you so much, Sam. Appreciate you. Thanks, Raj.